Hello, welcome to St. Matthew's. This is our June 30th service of noon renewal. My name is Reverend Merv and I work on the staff here at the parish. Reverend Philip is on a well-earned rest for holidays and I'll be with you for the next two or three meetings together. I wanted to spend some time today talking to you about the Lord's Prayer and perhaps offering you a way to be more reflective in saying that prayer and praying that prayer as you continue in your own faith journey. There was a, an old saying in my family, familiarity breeds contempt. I sort of think it was my mother's way of living out a life as an introvert and not getting too close to anybody. But there is some truth in that saying. And when we come to something that is well-worn and familiar as the Lord's Prayer, it's just uh, too easy, isn't it, to take it for granted and to undervalue it for that reason. We can pray it so easily and thoughtlessly and quickly that we no longer hear its richness or the guidance and understanding that it offers. We can lose its significance because of that. But, you know, it is Jesus' own words and direction to his disciples when they wanted to know how to pray. I'm sure they wanted to know how to pray the way he prayed, as he did so regularly and so often on his own, apart from them. Jesus, tell us how to pray properly. We've been brought up in the Jewish tradition. We have certain ways that we know to pray, but there's something about your life that has power and energy that we don't understand. So tell us how to do it. And so that's really where the prayer comes back. I was on a retreat in the sisters, the mother house of the sisters of St. John the Divine some time ago. And in that period of time, heard a sister praying the Lord's Prayer in this reflective way I'm going to share with you today. And it's based on small pieces of the prayer broken out with long periods of silence after each one so that the meaning of each phrase could be richly embedded in our hearts and that we might understand it better. Now I'm going to fill some of that space as I try to tell you the kinds of things to think about as you reflect on each phrase. So we're going to begin together. But first, let's just con con convocate ourselves in the presence of the Spirit as we do this. Dear God in heaven, we give thanks for your spirit and that your spirit abides with us and teaches us all that we need to know from the word of God and the life of Jesus. Be with us now as we think about the Lord's Prayer, the one that was so important to Jesus that he taught it to his disciples. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we begin with the prayer. It starts, Our Father in heaven. You see in that phrase, the intimacy of a family. We're talking about God as our father, which is something that is now true because Jesus has died and raised from the dead and welcomed us, is, welcomed us as members of the family of God. We often talk about that way, but this prayer actually asks us to, to speak as if we are a part of God's family. In some translations, you might even want to say, my father, my daddy in heaven, because it is a much more intimate way of thinking about it. Uh, it, is, it is by grace, God's grace, that we are adopted into God's family. And this prayer comes out of that relationship. And uh, I want you to notice, too, that the pronoun that's used here is our. It's a collective and plural pronoun. You see, this is actually a community prayer. And it belongs in the gathered community of faith. And that's why it's there in all of our liturgies. But when we pray it as an individual, on our own perhaps, we do so with the whole people of God in our hearts and minds. We pray it as part of them. I mean, worship is a prior responsibility in prayer. We are to reverence God's name. That's why we say, hallowed 
be your name. Holy, you are holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And in that phrase, you get encapsulated the whole point of God's redemptive work in the world. And it's because the Christian family shares a task to help complete God's reign in the world that we need each to express and act out our commitment to that goal. So we move from that statement of truth or several statements of truth to petitions. We ask God to give us today our daily bread. And that is something important to think about. Note that the frequency of our gift of bread is daily. It's not tomorrow, it's today. This is some indication of how we are to place our materialistic instincts in a certain context. God provides enough today. How many of us are instead consumed by future provision, worrying about tomorrow? This prayer asks us to be very carefully rooted in the now. It goes on. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgiveness received makes us more fully human and able to offer forgiveness to others. It's a very important statement and it's very far up in the prayer that it, forgiveness is part of the energy that makes our community work. We are forgiven ourselves as individuals because Christ died for us and has absorbed our sinfulness, if you like. But we also are to absorb the sinfulness of others who grieve us. So forgiveness works both ways. It's forgiveness to others that makes the community work. You know, it's the little words that can get you sometimes in scripture. The little word here is as. It suggests that forgiveness given and received are actually connected in God's eyes. That's a really important thing to remember as we try to live together as a Christian community. Prayer goes on. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. It helps us to note that our struggle with with brokenness is never over in our own lives either. We continue to struggle with that brokenness and rely on God's forgiveness and that of each other for our health and wholeness. And it's important to remember that Christ embeds this truth in a daily prayer. It's something that every day we need to remember that we are forgiven and that we are called to forgive. And that is where health and wholeness comes for each of us and for the whole community of which we are part. After those petitions are outlined, we find that the perspective of the whole prayer is reaffirmed. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. That is why we offer this prayer to God. It is why that daily prayer is rooted in our understanding of who God is. It's a reminder in a sense of ourselves to finish this prayer with a reaffirmation of who the one we pray to really is and what the eventual outcome of our life in Christ together will be. Now, when you have time at home on your own, I suggest you go through each of these pieces of the prayer and allow time for God to speak to you about their significance one by one as you work your way through the Lord's Prayer. I know that it's difficult to believe all this prayer says, even as we pray it so regularly. Doubt or simply lack of care can make any prayer distant and irrelevant in our lives, but especially so for such a familiar one. 
But prayer needs to be an ordinary activity in our lives, a daily activity infused with possibilities and God's love. It's simple, yes, but also divine. I love the purity and functionality of Shaker furniture. And so did Thomas Merton, a real saint of the church. He said this, and it's true about our prayer. The peculiar grace of a shaker chair is due to the fact that it was made by someone capable of believing that an angel might come and sit on it. An angel might come and sit on it. That's how we pray. We pray in the awareness that we are speaking to the Holy One of creation and that the spirit that is in us will make those words meaningful and truthful for God. So as we close, may that be true of our lives in prayer, both lived and said, alone and in community. May we pray expecting that God hears our prayer and will answer them if we listen carefully. Amen.